hard to believe that individuals can steal property away from another without just cause. The person you're about to meet lost his entire life savings fighting to keep his titled property, which corruption overlapped, truth, and stole from the family. As Americans, you should be very concerned that you could lose your property in similar fashion. Lawyers have won cases by colluding with other lawyers, though seemingly cruel and unjust, that take property away from rightful owners. Just yesterday, my good friend Susan from my high school heard on the news that in Florida, homeowners are losing their property in similar fashion. This seems to be an epidemic. They're illegal, and similar cases are becoming a little bit more common. This is a current trend to move in on another's property, simply muscle the owners out and take it away. I have with me as my guest, Cy Sharp, who lost his property inappropriately. I realize that this is a, um, a new and different area for most of the people that watch our program, but certainly, definitely something that has to be spoken about. So you lost everything. What would you say, if you can give me kind of a highlight film, how it went from beginning to end? I, I know this may take a while. I'll only sure. interrupt you if I want some a correction for the audience. Okay. Um, I suppose the whole thing started in 1995. Uh, as a family effort, we uh, acquired a property in Brooklyn. It was completely desolate. Maybe out of a 16-unit apartment building, there were four families, um, and they were living in substandard conditions. It was a drug den. There were people firing BB guns on the other side of the street, and uh, it was quite horrible. We uh, went in, you know, my father was the vanguard behind it because he, we had a construction business and he just did all the renovations. And um, from there, we turned it from a completely dilapidated uh, property into um, so you a You upgraded place. the property, exactly. Clearly. Yeah, we, in a place that any of us would be proud to live. And then um, years went by, um, about two, three, well, Three years ago, um, you know, at, at some point we were um, catering mainly to um, you know low-income families, people of uh, uh, the, the former veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces, single mothers, and uh, they um, we had a, a subsidy that uh, that they were receiving, uh, the Advantage program. Right. That was suddenly cut, and we had more than half the families there that were on this subsidy. And oh we were expected to provide services without any compensation. And the and requirement that, of the subsidy. Right. To meet the subsidy's requirement. Right. We still had to, you know, give a, put a roof over everyone's head, but we could not afford services. We barely could afford anything. And what happened was, at some point, people knew that we were vulnerable. Um, there was an investor who emerged um, about two and a half years ago he stated that um, he had a contract that agreed to sell the property at one-third of the value because um, the property is worth at least three to four million dollars but he said that he had a contract to, to buy it for 1.3 million dollars and he's Some arbitrary number right and he threatened us with legal action. And you didn't pay him for this? You didn't put the down payment on this? You didn't? No, we never received. So he claimed you, he, re, you, he received this money from you? No, he, he never, well, he claimed that he gave a deposit, but I didn't uh, receive money. I never authorized anyone to receive money on my behalf, or, you know, because my, uh, it was my father and myself at, you know, all relevant times that are the owner of the property. And you would have uh, been able to know that kind of deal. Pardon me? You would have been able to know. Some, you know, right. it should have been obvious. Yeah, yeah, neither of us knew about it. And then uh, he said that uh, he had friends in the court system, and he said that the judge was part of his community, and that uh, he would take this There's property. a nice big red flag. Exactly. And he's, <laughs> you know, he said we can do this the nice way, or we can do it the hard way. Wow. And go through the court system. Sounds like coercion to me. Absolutely. And um, two years ago, to this day, he sued us f to take this, the property from us, mm -hmm. the property that's been in my family for 20 years. Right. 
And what happened was, uh, once he sued us, they, they didn't waste any time. Uh, practically within 24 hours, they got a, a temporary restraining order against our property. We could not make leases anymore. You know, that's If they didn't have title, how could they get restraining order against the property? Well, they created a lawsuit saying that they had a right to, through, through a contract that was completely bogus, um, claiming that they've given down payment good, is good interest. Yeah, they claim they made a down payment. They claim that the owners consented to the property, but none of this was true. They never provided any documentation hmm. that either myself or my father agreed to Se this. Second red flag. Exactly. And, you know, they, they, there was no, no documentation. And then, within 24 hours, they get a judge and this is all in Kings County, by the way, it's Kings County Supreme in Court. In Brooklyn, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, had, they got a judge to sign off on this with no evidence that, number one, we cannot sign leases. That's, you know, the lifeblood of any landlord. Sure. You have to sign leases to get new tenants when necessary, get the cash flow right. going. And number two, we could not refinance our property. The, the, all conveyances were completely halted, and that stopped our right to redemption. You know, every, every homeowner, every property owner has a right to redemption under laws in virtually every state in America. And when you are, because, uh, you know, people, when people describe like, that, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the big business people, they can afford to, you know, uh, pay off mortgages at will. But, you know, folks like you and me, we have to refinance and we could not refinance. So we were completely at the mercy of this investor and, and the his, judge yeah and the judge who the this gentleman said was part of his family family part of his community well, yeah and um wow it's it's it was really heavy because uh we just uh we were completely uh, unable to do anything unable to do anything at we the were, mercy of the documentation that was processed and, and approved right we were completely broadsided and you could only appeal at that point not at that. Well, at that point, it was a very young case. Well, there was no decision at that point. There, yeah, there right, were a few. Right. Th we were a few days into it, and um, my father had an attorney. Well, he did not have an attorney. I mean, I'm saying that that he supposedly did. Hmm. There was an attorney that um, he was talking to about the case, and then my father um, he he uh, he was very suspicious about this attorney. He said that he. Um, asked him for a power of attorney, which was, goes beyond the scope. Usually you do a retainer agreement, but a power of attorney gives this an attorney virtually any power over you. Right. And my father said, well, why do you want a power of attorney? And then he says, well, isn't that what all the lawyers get? And my father was very nervous at that mm. point. And just within 24 hours, he had a heart attack. Wow. Yeah. He was, uh, he was in Huntington Hospital. And Did he die on that day? Oh, he's so f he's okay. He's oh, okay. he's okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. You know, um, actually, <laughs> I should say we uh, we owe our his continued health to the fact that we had the sense to uh, bring him to um, St. Francis. He got the best cardiologist over there. Right. Right. And um, while all this was happening, while I was I because I was I looked for the uh, cardiologist. I researched who the best cardiologist was in Long Island. While this was going on, there was a hearing for this temporary restraining order. Were you notified? Um, I oh, barely it's a, it's knew It's a bad time to have... It, it's a bad time. Yeah. I mean, I was, all I was thinking about was my father. And, you know, I, there was an attorney for me as an individual, not for my corporation, which owned the property, because I didn't want anyone to do that. I didn't right. want anyone to make any decisions about that. I just wanted to answer what, what was right. being written in court. So while I was looking after my father, they sign what's called a stipulation to stop the case. And that stipulation gave them our property in such a way that they, number one, it would be at this completely, ridiculously, arbitrarily reduced price. Number two, in a manner that we could never be paid because it was uh, put in so-called court escrow account. We would never see this money. It's just going to be held 
so that people could pick away at it until yeah. there's nothing it's, 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 left. To complete the operation, have funds available to, to make it worse for you. Precisely, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> yeah. So um, this, uh, the judge who, from what I've heard from other attorneys, he has this um, reputation, his nickname is King Solomon because he makes these very quick decisions. He has a 90% um, a settlement. Rate. No, no, a 90% settlement rate that right. he gets people to settle cases. Right. Finished, you know, and um, what happened was uh, before I, you know, before my father was even transferred to St. Francis, I find out, oh, there's an agreement to sell this property at a completely reduced rate, and you know, I'm I'm still worried about my dad. I don't deal with this until right. the next the week after, and um, you know, so I you just couldn't have um, somehow pleaded that simple case that uh, right. no decision should be had, write some kind of writ or something that say no decision on the property can be had or something like that, you know, at this time while we're under duress. Right. I, well, that, that should be, ideally, but, you know. Yeah, in, no, it's an ideal, I realize that, yeah. In, in my opinion, there are even worse issues out there regarding this issue, yeah. which I'll touch on later. Yeah. But, um, you know, I spoke to the attorney who supposedly represented me. He, at some point he claimed to represent my corporation even though I never gave him that permission. There's nothing, absolutely nothing in the documentation that says that I gave him the power to represent my corporation. Mm. And I said, you know, I, you know. There has to be a, a special document that gives, gives, authorizes power of attorney and you have to sign it. Right. And, and that didn't happen. That didn't happen. In fact, I, I saw a letter in my inbox saying, you know, I want you to sign a power of attorney. I never did such a thing. You know, this yeah. was after the fact. Because right. I guess he wanted to cover his tracks later on. And, you know, I, you know, when the point was made that this is unacceptable, he comes back, says we owe him $70,000 for coming to court once. Hmm. And he says he will not get off the case until he is paid, paid. $70,000. Wow. Job un mm -hmm. unnoticed, undone. Yeah. Never did anything. Yeah. And in the meantime, this attorney who said he represented my father while he was in the hospital and never consented to this, he feeds my father lies, saying that, well, the judge made a unilateral decision that we're going to give this property to them. And um, he, um, you know, my father eventually made it completely clear because what happened was he this other attorney filed papers in court he filed an aff an alleged affidavit mm. which did not even have my father's written signature it was a typewritten signature saying that he agreed to this conveyance he wanted well, to there's an awful lot of holes in this there's an awful lot of holes in this and that i haven't even gotten to all the holes yet this yeah. is just we're just getting to it we're just uh, digging away and we're about halfway through the program, so I wanted, wanted you to be able to get to the end. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we're, yeah. we're like into the first month. I should just yeah. uh, get cut to the yeah. chase. Okay, so what happened was... further, yeah. Yeah, my father said, this guy doesn't represent me. He sent a letter to Judge David Schmidt, who was the first judge of the case. said, you know, I never authorized any of this. You know, this, he doesn't represent me. He doesn't, and, and the judge ignored this. You know, all this stuff stayed on the record, completely unchallenged, as if it were gospel. And then later on, uh, what happened was they sent people to our property, because we still had title to it. They sent people to invade our property, to trespass, and say, we didn't own the property. This is uh, the, well, belongs oh, yeah. to these new investors. Wow, a staged yeah. event. Yeah, don't pay us. The, they said, don't oh, pay us the mackerel. money. Don't pay the Sharps the money. Pay it to us. Wow. And, you know, I, we, made, I made a, we made a police report at NYPD. They never followed through. Um, later on, we went to the district attorney, uh, tr uh, Carl, uh, Charles Hines, Hines, Hines yeah. the guy who later got in trouble for using uh, confiscated drug money for his re-election campaign, and he didn't do anything about mm. it. And um, so we're very concerned at this point because we have someone doing these things, and we have a court that uh, is completely not in their pocket. Not responsive and in their pocket, non yeah. yeah. Completely non-responsive. So we take this to bankruptcy court, and that's when things get really weird. We go to bank. They do an immediate uh, 
my, my, the, the attorney who claimed to represent my father and the adversary attorney, they got together, openly got together. Um, my, uh, the, the guy who claimed to represent my father, he, he actually retained that our enemy law firm to represent him in bankruptcy court. He claimed to be a creditor of the corporation and my father, even though he never got any judgment of any kind. And they just got together in this way. Um, they threatened the bankruptcy judge. I mean, the, the, the it's a more close-knit community than you were aware of when yeah. you said that. You know, exactly. now it's starting to come clear, right? Right, okay. and it, it was Judge Trust in the Suffolk County uh, Bankruptcy Court that uh, our adversary's attorney had just started shouting and screaming in the courtroom. And two U.S. Marshals came to see what was going on. He goes out into the hallway, makes a phone call. Within five minutes, they stop a trial that's going on in bankruptcy court just to see us and to stop the automatic stay that when we file for bankruptcy, that's what happens. When you file for bankruptcy, you get an automatic stay. So they were trying to get rid of that for their own nefarious purposes. So from then on, it pretty much goes downhill. I mean, I never represented myself before in court, so mm. I'm just learning this stuff. I used to work for an attorney, uh, yeah. Burke Probitsky, which I yeah. think was a very honorable man. Yeah, I know Burke, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so um, what happened didn't was... didn't know he did yeah, pass, passed away. <laughs> God rest his soul, he yeah. was a wonderful man of integrity. He tried. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so... so where are you now? I mean... Um, where am, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So wait, we did a motion to vacate the stipulation, and the judge, who was the former chief administrative judge of uh, New York, Ann Fowl. Oh, okay. Ann Fowl. Okay. Well, she had a lot of oh, power. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. And anyway, she d denies my motion, says that the property should go to them, and through a sheriff's title, if I don't sign off on it. Of course, I don't sign off on it, because I never agreed to this stuff in the first place. By July of last year, they take the property forcefully through a sheriff's title, give it to them. I never see a penny of this. And um, months later... So even if you were to have said in some way that the sale price, you owe this amount of money for the sale price, you didn't receive that either. No, I, I, we never got a penny of this money, yeah. you know, supposed money. I don't even think any of this money exists. I think they... Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what we were supposed to do. You know, I'm a complete layperson, so we go to the Attorney Grievance Committee. They don't do anything. They say, get a lawyer. At some point, we do get a lawyer. We get $15,000 of borrowed money to hire a lawyer. This lawyer, within a few days of getting the money, completely skips out on us. Yeah. And we make a complaint against her, and then they're like, well, just find a lawyer. It's like, well, you know, how many times are we going to have to borrow yeah. money and find another lawyer and another lawyer? Have them skip out. And when are they going to finally do their job? And we force you to yeah. sue everybody in your path, because it looks like that's what you had to do, and that's a yeah. major task. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's what we have to do. We have to sue our adversaries everybody attorney, because the what they did was so heinous, I can actually yeah. sue them. Right. But uh, and, and our own attorney. I would suggest you do. But the thing is, I can't do that because the, the judge wrote this very long order in their favor with a completely different set of facts. She ignored the material facts. She went against all the controlling authorities, which means the case law, the statutes. She just went against all of that, made this 22-page illusion that she's right. Most attorneys so It this. came in the form of, the, of a decision, didn't it? Yeah, a big, big well, that's decision. that's appealable. It is appealable, and I did file my appeal right. February 19th, 2014, and um, you know it, it's just sitting there in the Appellate Division Second Department. I don't even have a, an oral argument date yet. For all I know, maybe they'll never answer this thing. And what do I do? I mean, they took my property. I have, and you know, I couldn't afford a, an appellate lawyer. A, every appellate lawyer wanted sure. bare minimum. They wanted thirty thousand dollars. I mean, I hope the information we give on this program is able to get you to another level. I mean, I hope I, so. I really hope so. I, above all, we need visibility because right. th what this demonstrates is that n the lawyers, the judges, they had no incentive to do the right thing. Because I made many complaints. They were probably benefited financially, or some way. I have no doubt. Because why else would they do something sure. like that? Sure. I mean, uh, it's usually out of greed. It's. I don't think it was out of pure malice, it had to be great. Financial greed, right? Yeah. So, what's your next step? My next step, well, I have two more appeals to do because Judge Fowl made three decisions against me. Just yesterday, a judge uh, makes, a new judge, Judge Martin Solomon, makes a decision that 
uh, one of the attorneys, the one who collude, openly colluded with our adversary, deserves $92,000 for a single court appearance. And then the uh, the is this attorney, amazing or yeah, what? This and then is amazing. The attorney who claims to represent my corporation, he gets seventy thousand dollars for coming to court once for giving away my property in a way I can't get a penny. Yeah, I don't know. We uh, did you ever hear of an Article seventy eight? This is too far down the path for you, mm, probably. Possibly. Could you have taken it's to, uh, to perform their specific duty? They're not performing. Nobody's. They're just passing the buck. I have to. Or look, avoiding it. I have to look into this to see. Can I do an Article 78 against the appellate judges themselves? Yeah, I, I, I would have do it for everybody. It looks like they. You know, it looks like you have to. Right, but I'm thinking I have to go to the federal level, because I think what they did was totally against due process. And in the case of the bankruptcy court, they committed bankruptcy fraud against. That's right. It That's is against due RICO. process as well. Yeah. That's under the RICO Act. Yeah. And the due process is 1942, 1983. That, that's real. We, we saw you at the Moreland Commission. I was the first member of the public to testify at the Moreland Commission. What happened Commission. there? Um, they, you know, I was there with the, the, the co-chairs, uh, what's his name, uh, co-chair Fitzpatrick. Uh, who was I, the I was online there. I mean, I went to the Moreland Commission to testify too, but I never got in. So go ahead. Okay, Sorry. well, yeah, the, there were all these DAs, the, the, the whole... The committee was filled with district attorneys from all over New York State. And the co-chair, William Fitzpatrick of Onondaga County by um, Syracuse, he yeah. says, we're going to look into this. I never heard anything. And not only that... Well, they disbanded the, the yeah. commission altogether, I'm so you may never hear from them. I'm not surprised, because I think yep. between my case and whatever they found in the legislature, they found a lot of corruption, and they just don't want to deal with it. Right. And I'm hoping Pre Perara gets into this, but I'm not holding my breath. I really not. You know, the politicians give me what happened to you when you approached them. I went to Steve Israel. He didn't do anything. Um, Marcelino, uh, Senator, State Senator Marcelino, yeah, right. he wouldn't even give me an appointment. I went to uh, uh, Chad Lupinacci, Lupinacci in the State, State Assembly. Assemblyman. That's your closest assemblyman. And, and yeah. what he does is he gives me like. Uh, the Hofstra um, the, law school, the, the law school there, students, yeah, students against like a high-powered Manhattan-based law firm. Well, when when he gave you that recommendation, didn't you say that this is placating your the, your, your position, your your intention here? Um, I said it was insufficient, and he said it was the best he could do. But what it might have been, unfortunately. And if that is, that's that pretty, is a, pretty bad. That represents a complete systemic failure in our government. Absolutely. Because what needs to be done is they need to get involved. Judges need to be disciplined, and the attorneys need to be disciplined and disbarred. You know, the Moreland Commission was Cuomo's baby, I think he started that. But that was intentional because there was supposed corruption somewhere down the line. That's what got him involved in it to begin with. As soon as the corruption came to the front, they closed, they shut the door down on it. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. No, no one's surprised who is in our position, you know, the, yeah. the aggrieved parties, are, you know. But anyone else, okay, next. Exactly. They're not going to deal with it. Right. Um, what, what is in your immediate future now? Um, right now, I'm researching methods in which I can bring this to federal court. Um, I'm thinking perhaps I need to bring an action against the state of New York so that they finally do their job. I would be bringing actions up every place I could. I know, right. I know, I realize it's a burden on you. It is a big burden on me. I mean, because it's when, when you bring an action and they don't do anything about it, it's, it's very demoralizing. Yeah. You yeah. can't give up because this I'm is glad you're not giving up. I can't. Eat healthy, get plenty of rest <laughs> because you're going to need a lot of fortitude. Anytime you get sucked into something like this, exactly. I know that everyone crumbles. They, they just yeah. fall away. They can't, they can't right. sustain themselves too well. Yeah. Completely understandable. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah, I'm, right. in, I'm in this for a long haul. I'm going to fight these guys as long as I'm still breathing. Good. You know, I'm very glad to hear that you make a strong advocate, well, certainly at least for yourselves, and you should anyway. Right. Um, last, any last comment, because we only have uh, a minute left. What would you like to see? What is there um, uh, I will hope to have? What can I do for you, you know, if anything? I, I need anything. I mean, I need... You can give you some YouTube visibility. I need YouTube visibility. I need networking with powerful people. I need to find out, I, I need large law firms, because for instance, I don't know if you heard about this, but in Long Beach, there was a case where the attorney signed a stipulation without the, uh, the council's permission. There was a big developer that they were up against. There was big money involved. And to get out of that, the Long Beach had to hire two big law firms just to scare these guys away. I can't afford to do right, something right. like that. I need people to step in to help me. You need a guy like Burke. 
I, but you know, Burke was great. It's small, I know. But I need big, big, big names. And the bigger you go, the bigger the bucks are going to be. Exactly. And I, we don't have money. Feel I need This is, I what, need happens, donations this is too. what happens to a lot of people. We all got to do what we can. I know how difficult it is. We're um, about so, ready. Yeah, we're about ready to close up the door on the show. But I want to thank you very much for Sai for you know giving us the best information you probably you probably could. Yes, please spread the word. This is yeah. a very big deal. I'll do that to anyone with the property. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Societal and political trends are rapidly breaking down. The family that once was the cornerstone of our great American culture at FIT. We know you cannot get this information on your own. Certainly, something like this is not going to come easily to any network media, right? My name is Chris DiMaggio. Uh, we always invite all opposing views, and we'll see you again next week.